good evening. First of all, I, I'm Beverly, and I'm just kidding. And uh, we would like to thank you all for having us here this evening. And uh, our pleasure to be with you all. I'll give you a little more detail about the Arbor Gate. We are located in Tomball, Texas. And uh, we will be 23 years old on March the 1st. So, step of the way. Even as a, as a young girl, she would come hang out at the nursery uh, after school and on weekends and summer. So I'm very proud to have her as part of our family. Uh, the Arbor Gate specializes in roses, uh, herbs, perennials, natives. We have typical shrubs always, but we have display gardens. And we're really very proud of them. It kind of gives you an idea of how things are supposed to look or not supposed to look, given our weather and our climate. Uh, we were also very proud to be a part of the Earth Tide Rose Tribes. Works very closely with Gay and uh, Dr. George. And our Rose House is dedicated to the wonderful Gay family. So you all have a yes. <laughs> so, in thinking about this talk tonight, uh, Kenan and I thought it might be interesting for all of you to, to go over the questions and the things that, that customers ask us almost on a daily basis. The problems that people are having, the challenges, and kind of a basic how to, what to do, when to do, and how to do it. So it's going to be very informal, uh, but we wanted to kind of go over those things with you. Uh, one piece of advice I'd like to give you and I'm sure you all know this as gardeners. Just remember the best gardeners have killed the most plants. <laughs> That's how we learn. That's how we learn. And if you always want to tackle any project, you eat that elephant just one bite at a time. Sometimes we look at our landscape or look at, at what's ahead of us and it just seems such a daunting task. So I always recommend to people, when you pull in the driveway, what, what bothers you the most? When you pull in, there's always going to be one spot that you catches your eye and you think, you know, I really got to do something about that. So that's that's where a good place to start and finish what you start. Don't try to spread it all out through the lawn or the landscape. You'll spend so much money and so much time, and it won't show. Once you complete an area or a spot, then it all the ball starts rolling and it all starts fitting and and working itself into place. So just eat that elephant one bite at a time. So oftentimes, you know, you're going to start with, with what I said, either a new garden location, a new spot that needs help, or reinventing an older existing. And a lot of times when we have a home that we've been into for many, many years, you know, that's like giving your whole house a facelift. It's like recreating the interior. To put in some new plants, some younger plants, some fresher plants, and you won't recognize your home. I was gonna say, that's a lot of things, especially with all the flooding, a lot of people have experienced that. That's a great opportunity because they had a lot of damage. Then you can come in and really revamp those spaces, and it's your great opportunity when you're doing the inside of your home to make the outside fit and flow with it as well. Right. And so the first thing you're gonna consider is we ask, uh, oftentimes when I ask somebody, says, well, look, I'm doing a new bed. I need some help, what, you know, give me some ideas. What is your goal? What do you want? from that space? Do you want a habitat? Do you want color? Do you want evidence? Do you want roses? You know, what, what is it that you envision or want to have into that space? So that's going to be your first consideration. Kind of get that organized in your brain, you know, where you're going with that. And then look at maybe what style that you would like to have. Do you want a, a cutting garden? Do you want a, a country cottage garden? Do you, again, want a native habitat? Do you want to bring in your butterflies, your bees? Do you want to feed the birds? Just exactly what style or what look. Do you want Tuscan? Do you want formal that you're going to lean yourself towards? Well, and one thing when we were going through different styles, we were talking about the Zurich type concept. And that's one thing, again, I kind of go back to the water factor. Um, a lot of people come to us and tell us that they're looking for a Zurich type landscape. Everybody wants no maintenance. Um, I do some consulting at Arbor Gate with customers on landscaping, and that is one of the first things everybody comes to. They're like, I want it to be colorful all the time, and I want no maintenance. So everybody... <laughs> 
I know, it, it, it's one of those things that to me just doesn't quite go together and we have to kind of back it well. And so they kind of go zero. But I have to remind people that we're not in a climate that necessarily lends itself to that. And that for us, Zurich is, can be at times bog plants. You know, that's what fits for us. Spell out that word you just mentioned, Zurich? X E R I C, or a Zurich scape. Some people, they jokingly call it zero scape because it's fairly minimal, but um, in our climate, it's not always appropriate. Yeah. We've got good soil, we've got lots of rain. And, and lots of humidity. At, yes, a lot, lots of humidity. So then the next thing you're going to want to do is look at your sun. And I know that sounds just basic and simple, but you know, you go to your kitchen window at certain times of the day. You go to certain, certain areas of your house certain times of the day. Well, this might be a location that you're not looking at all day. I want to say, you know, go outside, tend to or 10, you know, 8, 10, 12, 4, 2, you know, make, make yourself a timeline and go look at that space and see, actually see where the sun is. Not so much the winter sun, you know, we can, winter sun is so gentle, we can put anything in full winter sun, even our shade plants. It's that summer, 2 o'clock on, that's the killer sun. And you have to know where that sun is. Because when you say, well, a plant is part shade. Well, that's very confusing sometimes. So part shade means typically that by 1 o'clock in the afternoon, that plant needs to be in the shade on the Gulf Coast. It doesn't mean part shade in the afternoon. So morning sun or morning shade afternoon sun. That's a full sun plant in Texas or on the Gulf Coast for us. So one o'clock on, it's a full sun plant, even if it's in the shade all morning long. So you really need to map that sun and see where that hot summer sun is. Also bear in mind your neighbor's trees, not just your trees, but your neighbor's trees. <coughs> Depending upon your exposure, they can shade your lawn more than your own trees will. And then during the winter, they're deciduous. So a shade bed in the summer may be a full sun bed in the winter. So that, that enables us, in a situation like that, to grow all the great heirloom bulbs because they're active and growing during the winter months. Well, that's, that's okay. It's under a tree, but it has no leaves all winter. So they're getting the sun that they need. They're dormant when the tree has foliage. So that works out just perfect. So I can't emphasize enough how much you need to look for that summer sun. The other thing, of course, is drainage. Just because something drains on the surface does not mean it is draining at the root zone, at seven, eight, ten inches down. Most of the time, <coughs> we live close to an area called the Woodlands. I've dug holes in customers' yards not even 10 inches deep, and have water seep up from the bottom of the hole. So that's not uncommon in our area to see that kind of water deep in the soil, but the surface looks perfectly dry. Well, I was just saying, and what exacerbates that issue with us too is so many of the newer communities that have come in where they bring in these loads and loads of base material to build these houses on, and then they just <coughs> sprinkle a nice topping of some very inconspicuous topsoil there. So what you know they, they don't see it when they initially come in and start doing their gardening, but they get deeper down into their project and realize that they've got this big long lasting issue that they're gonna have to really work on building up. And with that too, it's not just um, when you're doing the gardening, not building, not digging out all of that clay because that becomes a bigger issue. You kind of, I always like to tell people when you're doing that, you kind of create almost a little mini Lake Conroe when you're doing that. It's a clay bottom lake and if you dig all that out, you've left this pond or bowl for those plants to reside in and you'll automatically have a huge substantial amount of root rot. So you don't, yes sir? Can you saw this and put it in the top? You can. There's a couple of different ways. Um, some people will go, um, if they're building new beds, they will kind of 
pull the material up and create kind of a turtle back type effect and put your new soil on top of it, or just in general amending the area that you're working with and using different materials like expanded shale and things like that to build those spaces. And like Ken was saying, ex uh, digging the clay away is probably one of the worst things that you can do. If you are not, if it's up against a house with foundation, your weed holes are too low, you can't build up real high in that area or right up against the wood fence. You know, you want to amend the soil that you have, but you always have to use your soil. We're just going to make it better. And one of the most uh, effective is the expanded shale. It's an instant and permanent amendment to aerate or make dense soil breathe. Uh, conversely, if you have a lot of sandy soil, it also helps regulate the moisture. If you looked at it under magnification, it has hundreds of little tunnels in it. So that water will collect in there, it will put the air spaces in because of those tunnels, or if you have sandy soil, it'll hold the water there and release it slowly as the surrounding area starts to dry. So it works either way. But I will mention that not all soil is created equal. So you want to be very careful uh, and mindful where you purchase your soil and what the contents or the ingredients of the soil is. Uh, peat moss can do more harm than good in our climate. It becomes soupy and it will hold a lot of water and wet, but it also packs very tightly and dries <coughs> out hydrophobic and doesn't accept moisture in dry season. What is that? <laughs> Peat moss. Peat moss. And there, I was saying, there's companies that we've been hearing lately, and I actually had somebody in just a day or two ago, that they're actually recommending people spreading peat moss on their, out grass. on their grasses and things like that. So yes. I'm not sure where the school of thought is coming from, or you know, if it's something that's coming from different uh, climate zones, and they're just trying to iterate it here, but it's not going to be effective for us like it would in other regions where they have different types of soils and different temperatures and rainfall and, and things like that. Sounds like you're taking straight from the peat Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting concept, but it's just, you know, every time they, they call us on that, it's, you just sit you there and hold your breath. Please don't, yeah. don't, please don't, don't do that. that. Uh, so I, I would be very remiss if I did not mention that the Arbor Gate makes a soil blend that is called Arbor Gate Soil Complete, and it is the perfect blend for our climate and any and every application. So it is a combination of row soil, vegan compost, azomite, green sand, expanded shale, decomposed mulch. It is a perfect blend for our climate, our soils, and our plants, and that means any plant from roses to herbs to vegetables to trees to shrubs. It's perfect, and not only as your building material, amending material, it's a perfect potting medium. So one soil will do any application that you have. So it's, it's, uh, it's very good. We love it. <laughs> love it for everything. Yes, sir. Do you sell it by the truckload? Yes, it is available in bulk. You can buy it by the yard. At the nursery, we have it only in the back. But we can give you the phone number and it can be delivered to you at fall. Yes, sir. Can be. Absolutely. Any other questions so far? Yes, sir. Yes. Would you then mix that in with the soil? Yes, you can mix it in with the soil or it's can you know you can you never can go too high in building a bed. And again, a lot of times one of my favorite go-to remedies, if somebody wants to plant in an area they just, maybe it's their best sun and they want to plant roses, but it stays foggy wet, you know, build a bed. I like, I like to build beds out of, or boxes, literally, out of two by 12 treated. Just build a frame, put it on the ground, and fill it up with Arbor Gate soil and plant right in there. There's no restriction on the root growth that way. You're getting the crown of your plant and your root up out of the soupy mess, and it works beautifully. But you could use rocks, you could use bricks, any material you wanted to. But if you need to dig an existing bed, 
you're just going to amend that hole. And you know, when you're working in a, a, an existing landscape that established it, sometimes it's just not reasonable to say, take everything out of that bed, let's start again. Every time you plant, whether it's a bedding plant, a perennial, another shrub, you just amend that area. And before you know it, you've amended your landscape. One body at a time. <laughs> yes, sir. What is the purpose of green sand? Green sand is, I guess, for lack of a better, a mineral. Yeah, it's <clears throat> nutrition. It's just nutrition. Anything else? It has nothing to do with drainage. No, sir. It does not. That would be your angular, angular sand. sand. And you don't want to use clay sand or any other angular sand. <coughs> Otherwise, it will pack and be no better than clay. So just putting sand is not, it's not going to achieve what your what your goal is for drainage. It has to be angular sand. No make sand in the middle. Play sand, any of that. The other thing uh, is is food, and it's very important that you feed and be very consistent with your feeding. Just remember, you want to feed the soil, and the soil is what feeds your plants. Uh, a healthy, well-fed plant is just like a healthy, well-fed person that resists disease and insects is more sturdy, and you'll get your optimal growth every time with that minimal effort that Ken was talking about. Um, and then on that note, we do make an organic, time-release blend of fertilizer. We were the first organic fertilizer in, in Houston to have mycorrhizal in our blend. Uh, we worked very closely with Dr. Mike Amaranthus, who is actually the doctor that, if you will, rediscovered mycorrhizal and came up with the formulation to make it marketable and usable to the general public. So we met with him, he came to Arborgate several times, I probably 16, 17 years ago, and we worked really closely with him in formulating our fertilizer. In fact, we used to sell, he would send us bags of mycorrhizal and we sold it in Ziploc bags, hand wrote on there what it was. Nobody knew what it was, but everybody looked at it, it's funny when we talked about it. But it, it, it's essential for good root growth for your plants. It's a beneficial fungus that attaches itself to the root of your existing plant. It is finer than the hair, of a root hair of a plant. So for the whole distance of that fiber, if you will, it's able to absorb nutrition and water from the surrounding soil. So it, it increases your root growth up to 100 fold when it attaches. We can plant uh, a forage bed plant at the beginning of a season. You know, for that season when we go and pull it up to change out season, we'll have a root ball like this. So it's incredible. Did you say mycorrhizal? <coughs> mycorrhizal. Please don't ask me to spell it. I know you're going to say it. I actually have it pulled up on my phone right now. Yeah, I it's M-Y-C-H. M-Y-C-H-O-R. Yeah, it's M-Y-C-H-O-R.
decreasing the amount of water that you have to have, and it can find nutrition in places that the roots would naturally be able to absorb it out of. So that makes a really big difference in um, your whole process for planting. Um, and there are, I know there's a couple of plants that it doesn't attach to, but I think azaleas are like one of the, one of the only things I can think of that it doesn't actually attach to. But it is absolutely phenomenal to see the plants when we pull them up out of the garden. It is, it, I have never, I mean, when you see a picture of something that's so small to have this root mass that is multiplied by the size of the plant, it's, it looks like, like roots. a very fine, white root here. What is it? What is it? Our fertilizer, it's a, our fertilizer is a gram, so a it's, in, it's in a homogenized, which most organic fertilizers are not homogenized. They just put all the components in the bag, so whenever you reach in the bag, unless you unless you mix it, you're not getting everything every time. So our food is it, it's actually in each gram. So this is part. It is part. Oh, yeah. That yes. component. Yes. The roots are that big. Have they been Oh, the, the plant, and you know, our beds, our beds are a great example because they are the, probably some of the most neglected flower beds you'll find because we have not a lot of time to spend in them and we have no sprinkler system. And when people come out in July and August and September and it's 100 plus degrees and we haven't had rain in a month, they're always flabbergasted. Now I won't say we don't water, but never more than once a week if necessary uh, but we just don't don't have a sprinkler and don't have a need for one well fertilizer blend. and i was going to say too adversely like when it hit on the opposite side of right. the of the summer heat i'll, I'll get with you with you just one second um, on the opposite side of the summer heat when we did have we went the, the water yeah three times um with the three different floods we were underwater to the degree that when I walked through the nursery during the flooding, it was about this deep on me. I had on rain boots and it didn't go good. I literally got to the truck and poured them out because I was so far below it. So all of our beds, for the most part, every display garden was underwater. The plants were submerged and I truly I don't think we lost a single plant, and I will completely testify that to the fact that those beds were able to drain off and they were the roots were able to receive oxygen so quickly after the rainfall because of the expanded shale and just the beneficials and the good microbes that were in those soils from everything that had been prepared beforehand. And it's just a building, it's, it's all about building blocks. The other thing too is, We've never sprayed our beds for insect or disease, ever. And when, when you, again, when you have a healthy plant, it's just typically not an issue. Just like your immune system. Yeah. And I won't say we don't give blemishes and, you know, my favorite uh, cure for a, a, an insect damage limb is to cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> Let it rain grow. I like the, what Felder Rushing says. If, if you think that there's a problem, step 10 feet back and see if it's... Take off your glasses and then look at it. it. <laughs> what was your question? Okay, Sorry. I have a question. You mentioned that there were 11 subtypes of the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, is it possible to target specific types to spe uh, specific plant purposes or types of plants? Or do, are they, do they work in multiplicity yeah. on one plant? Why do you put in 11 is my question. Well, there's, so there's, like I said, I don't want to get too deep into the science. There's endo and ecto, and ours has some of both in there, and they all work together yeah. to complete the process without getting too hard. And you don't know who's going to buy it for what purpose. That's right. <laughs> you have all the bases covered. Yeah, it's right. enough of everybody to do what you need to do and, and make everybody happy. Yes, ma'am. So, um, you know, like I'm out there in my garden right now trying to plan for uh, season and stuff. What would you, would you add compost to it, or what would you normally do to a garden besides pulling the weeds up and just to get it going again? Okay. Well, Very fresh, but that okay. Yeah. Typically, my favorite thing to do first thing in the spring is I um, put down a good, a good feeding of the blend of fertilizer, and I come over with one inch of the soil. It's like an organic sandwich. 
Okay, so you don't use your use your soil as a compost. Kind of yes. Compost. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's a perfect yeah. talk. It's a perfect talk dressing. And I was just saying, you with your organic sandwich, I think you should talk about your your, your nut grass successes. Mm. Well, nut grass, we all love it, yeah. and we all have it, and we all get it, um, and it's it's a it's a challenge to say the least. Um, I prefer to use organic whenever you know possible. I know sometimes you want to. You know, you might need a chemical to get something into control, but then always like to see people go back to the organic. So I had uh, a tree removed in a flower bed that stuck ground. So that area was, the soil was very depleted because of, because of that. Um, the breaking down of the roots and so forth pulls a lot of the nitrogen out of the soil. So that area was, was, was lacking. So I had this great bloom of nut grass. Some of the prettiest you've ever seen. <laughs> it was tall, beautiful green. So my husband decided that it needed to be sprayed. So I let him do it. And he used, uh, I think Image was the product that he did. <coughs> and he's of the mindset, you know, if they tell you lightly spray, we're gonna drown it. So he did. And, and it, it burned it down, and about three weeks later, it was as big and pretty and full as it could ever be. So he did it again, to the point that he kind of stunted some of my plants in the area and got a little overspray. So after it came back again, you know, one of the organic recipes for nut grass control is one half cup of agricultural molasses to one gallon of water. And that will cover a 10 by 10 foot area. You mix it in the bucket and you pour it on the ground. You're treating the soil because that's where the problem lies with nut grass. Because it typically goes crazy in an area where the soil is not at its best organically. So I decided to try an experiment. So I took the 10 by 10 area, pulled pulled as much nut grass as I could, nut and all. And I came through with a very generous application of Arbor Gate blend. I watered it in with the half a cup of molasses to a gallon of water and put an inch of Arbor Gate soil on top of it. There's not been a blade of nut grass since, and that's been over a year ago. And um, I should add, earlier, Arbor Gay Blend has agricultural molasses in it. So just know that, and the reason agricultural molasses is in our food is again, when we were formulating the food, uh, we went and met with Howard Garrett. He came to Houston several times with us. And uh, I asked Howard, I said, so if there was one thing that you could put in an organic fertilizer, what would that one thing be? He said molasses. Molasses is the best food that there is for the beneficial microbes in your soil. I have not had an ant bed in over 10 years. Anywhere in my garden. And I also say, we had several customers. Uh, <coughs> last summer I had, because again, there was, there was a lot of increased in ant activity, things like that with water flow and moisture and pushing them into different places. Um, I had several customers that came in. It was really ironic. It was within about a two week time. I think I had three people come by and all commented to me that with using a Harbor Gate blend, the organic fertilizer, on their lawn, that they actually had seen a huge depletion in the amount of fire ants that they had in their yard itself. So it again, was, it's the beneficial microbes. It's feeding them, and they're taking care of all the work for them. That base layer is what's really picking off. Well, the soil is not my problem, which is And we know about thrips. Beneficial nematodes are yes. Yes. Beneficial nematodes are wonderful. But uh, they're not. They're, beneficial they're not gonna, nematodes are attacking things in the soil, like your grub worms, your chinch bugs, your ants, fire ants, your fleas, fleas, things of that nature. Um, less on the side of anything that's going to be airborne or. And they and they do, but it's not. 
have, I was gonna say, I haven't ever seen it as a usage for that, but there, I mean, there's so many different yeah. applications, and a lot of times it's how you apply it as to what it takes over for two. We don't have trouble with drips on our roses in the back. Now we do have to watch it closely in containers. What do you do? What do we do for them? We have better, yeah, the Monterey horticultural oil is what we've had the best results from. And it's a succulent, so it's nothing that they can do. But that's what we've had the best luck with. And we're surrounded by a pasture plant. So that is the I'll say they love eating that grass. Yeah. It's a, it's a very finely emulsified mineral oil, so it's not as temperature sensitive as, say, mead or typical horticultural oil. So we really like it a lot. Um, and as I said, it's a succulent, so it's nothing that insects can become resistant to. It has a wide range of uses, and it's actually very beneficial, even against black spot and um, powdered mildew and black soot mold. So we had, yeah, yeah, but it's also saying it's nice because a lot of people when they wind up with black sooty mold, it's because they've got an insect issue. But being a suffocant tends to take care of both problems at once, and they're not having to go out and apply multiple different sprays for the same plant. The other question that we get asked very often is mulch. What type of mulch should I use? I would highly recommend that you stay far, far away from any dyed mulches, as that will leach into the soil, it's very toxic. You always want to stay with something that's more native. So a native pine bark with lid is an excellent, excellent choice. But um, our favorite is pine straw or pine needles. Pine needles is probably one of the best mulches that you can use. Uh, it doesn't move, it breathes. And weeds don't go through it. And if they do try to come up through it, they literally have to stretch so to grow, they almost pull themselves out of the ground. But if you think about when you go into an area with a lot of pine trees and the, and the, the needles that fall into the ground, what do you see growing under there? Nothing. <laughs> so pine straw, oftentimes for most people, is actually you know, free. Um, if it's not, if you have pine trees in your neighborhood and you have tree, uh, neighbors with pine trees, I bet they would love for you to come break them up for them. But I always just pull all my leaves and my pine straw into my flower beds. Uh, I'm never home, so it, it, it's a really good preventative for weeds. Very, very good. And every other state in the South, if you go to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, they all use pine straw but us. So, uh, and I don't know how or why we were so stricken with bark mulch in this area, but we are. And, uh, but pine straw is really, really a good way to go. Some people don't like it because they say it looks messy along the edges. Well, when you first apply it at that three inch level, you can literally lift it and roll it and make the prettiest clean edge with it you've ever seen. So, and then after that, after a rainfall or so, it just settles in. And it's wonderful, that red color stays, and it really highlights all of your landscape and your plants. So we do, uh, we sell a lot of pine straw. If we can get people to try it one time, then they will, uh, they will stay with it. I was gonna say, it doesn't, it doesn't deplete your soil and plants of nutrition like mulch. Mulches are, and especially so many of the mulches that have not been properly decomposed, so you don't have to worry about that. And also, another thing that a pe people have approached us with is acidity, but it really is fairly acid neutral. It doesn't add acid to your soil like a lot of people suspect that it does. Right. We have pine trees because we are slightly acidic, not because we put down pine trees. Right. <coughs> Very much so. It really keeps the soil cool. Yes. It really does a great job at that. But it also encourages the care of the roses. And the care of the soil. And the care of the roses. 
and you'll know for sure if there's any doubt at all about it. Call the consulting rules there. There you go. That'll work every time. But just remember that uh, the other thing is you want to, when you're designing your bed, you always want to pick out your bones or your evergreens first. Everybody always gravitates to what's blooming on the shelf or, you know, this is really pretty right now. But always go in first with your bones or your foundation plantings. Get those settled, get those in place, and then leave yourself the pockets for your perennials and your annuals. Always remember to work, I love work, working in odd numbers. You want to work in ones and threes and fives. It's a lot easier to make the bed look more balanced that way. And when you are coming in with your perennials and your annuals, you want to work in sweeps and you want to work in drips. You want to make an impact with what you're doing. So those, those are questions that we get asked often about, about plant selection. Well, I was just saying that even like with um, with doing mass color, when people want to integrate multiple different colors in with their annuals, um, one technique that we always do is is planting you know three or five of a color together and mixing them that way, as opposed to doing like one red, one white, one pink, one red. You know, but if you do three or five red, three or five pink, three or five white, you get this bigger mass and more impact that way than what you would if you completely intermixed them all through their one color of each plant at a time. Right. Yeah. And all that butterfly can see it better when you plant a, ma a mass. Very like much so. Yeah. Very much so. It's a lot more attractive to them and it's a bigger target for them to be able to get to. And really a lot of the same rules, if you will, apply to your container gardening. You know, you have your thriller, your filler, and your spiller. You have your big impact plant, you have your space taker, and then you have the one that drapes over. I know it sounds simplistic, but do always keep in mind that you get plans of life requirements, not only when you're planning your landscape, but planning your containers. You don't want somebody that is needy water-wise with somebody that doesn't want any water at all. So you always want to be mindful of that as well. <laughs> That's in containers? Yes, in containers, thriller, filler, and spiller. And the other thing that um, we will be approaching here fairly soon is um, people forgetting to think that season ahead. Um, a lot of times in the spring when we have things, you know, your snapdragons are in full bloom, the delphiniums are blooming, the larkspur, the sweet peas, the poppies, all of those things. Um, try to remind people that that needs to go in in the fall or, or you know, at latest now because they see those big beautiful blooms in the spring and wonder where they are but forget that they need to be planted that season before. So you always want to be thinking and planting a season ahead. The bulbs in in the fall. Is it like snapdragons in the fall? Yes. yes. Yep. Snapdragons and, and seeds. Well, seed or plant or transplant. We start getting the plants in usually in September, October. October. And all of the color that we bring into the nursery, well, almost all of our plants are locally grown. So they've been acclimated to our climate and there are varieties that we know work in our climate. And that's really important too. We don't bring pansies in from Michigan that when you open the door they lay down and die because it's 95 degrees here still and tons of rain. <coughs> Any other questions? You guys are fast. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
compacted and because those, especially those dive mulches and stuff like that, and even some of the others that they haven't been properly decomposed, they almost create a crust. And it's really hard for things to penetrate through them, like, I mean, anything to get through it. And I have seen it on multiple occasions make the soil underneath actually hydrophobic. It couldn't absorb water because it just got to that layer and stopped. It couldn't go anywhere. Most things we, with the Arbor Gate Blend, we typically use it because it is a building block and it's something that is constantly working and improving and, and, and building on itself. We usually apply it about every three months. Um, when you're doing it on the lawn, that's one really big benefit too, is that you can lessen your applications over the years because it does create an environment that is not necessary to reapply. Yep. Now on vegetables and things like that that are producing and growing at a much higher rate and uh, needing more nutrition to finish out their process, then that is something we typically do on a more frequent basis just because they're using it so quickly. Like tomatoes and peppers, when they're out there producing and putting all that energy into reproduction, they need to have that refurbished more, more quickly. Is now the time to grow <laughs> With the Arbor Gate blend, most definitely, there's not a time of the year that you can't put it down. There may be other types of fertilizers that, that would fall under the same tier with, but with the Arbor Gate blend, now is actually one of the most optimal times to put it down because since our soils don't freeze and our roots are always growing, it's a great time to get it in there, get those roots established, really give them that chance to get their self set before we get into the heat of the summer. So, I mean, that's with planting. You know, people forget that we have that 365 day planting season and that fall and, you know, it's kind of that forgotten spring for us. So this is our opportunity to get things in, get them established, make them happy and reduce that stress because now isn't the hard season for our plants, summertime is. So if you can get it going and get it established, you're one step ahead of the game and those plants are really able to take off and perform on the top because they're not having to focus under the soil as if you were planting in the spring. Well, we would like to thank you very much for having us this evening. Um, we passed out a class schedule for all you guys. We uh, have, press. yes, <laughs> and we had it printed today just for you guys tonight. But um, all of our classes are complimentary, and for if anybody here is a master gardener, almost every class that we offer, it counts to see you. So uh, I hope you'll come and see us all very soon. And again,